That was a unique introduction. I appreciate it very much. But it is good to be here at New Hope. You know, I just think, um, uh, and as I was worshiping over there, sometimes I just look out and I see so many faces that I just love. And it, it truly is just a joy to be your pastor. And as I was just praying during worship, uh, I just really felt a strong impression that, you know, if you're new to church, if you're, or maybe you've been in church your whole life, and you've got a question about the Bible and just something isn't clicking, um, you know, ask one of the pastors, ask someone in the church. You know, I've, I've had to ask many, many questions, um, and my dad comes to me all the time asking me questions about the Bible, you know, and, <laughs> no, but, um, but, but seriously, that's what we're here for. We're about discipling and making disciples. And there's no shame, there's, there's if, even if it seems something uh, like, oh, I should know this, you don't have to apologize. That's what we're here for. And so I just want to make myself available. I'd love to have coffee or, or lunch with you and answer any questions. And if I don't have any answers for your questions, we'll send you to Hawkins because he's like 120 years old and he knows everything. So it's Father Wisdom. But Anyway, uh, I love this time of year. How many have enjoyed the crisp, cool air? I love apple cider, pumpkin flavored everything, the World Series. Can the Cubbies pull it off? Oh boy, I don't know. The NASCAR chase is going on, the Sprint Cup Series. Go 48, Jimmy Johnson, let's, he's my man. Uh, college football, pro football, pro basketball just started back up. Um, the deer are in full rut right now, and uh, it, it is just a fantastic time of, of year. But I think the thing I'm most excited about is in less than two weeks, my wife is going to have our second child. Yeah, a, a baby girl, a baby girl. Her name is going to be Paisley, uh, Paisley. And so Sam uh, is going to be two in December, December 23rd. So he's in for a rude awakening, um, but uh, you could actually pray for Sam this morning. Uh, he was up most of the night last night, and he was, uh, I, we're not sure if he's sick, but uh, he's not doing well, runny nose and just really kind of clingy, and so just pray for him. But another thing you can pray for, and this is very serious, uh, Elizabeth's due November 11th, but we're really hoping that the baby will come on November 8th, so it'd be this giant distraction during election day, and we can have a reason to celebrate new life, you know, on, on that. So uh, pray that Paisley comes on the 8th. Um, would you turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1? We're continuing as we, we preach through this wonderful book, um, and, and Pastor Jeff and Hawkins both preached awesome sermons uh, the past couple weeks, and if you, you missed either one of those, go online, listen to them, you'll be encouraged and challenged. Uh, and I, I don't like preaching after Pastor Hawkins. Uh, it's kind of like uh, coming up to the plate after your cleanup hitter. And um, I, I feel it'd be much easier to, to follow my dad um, or something. Uh, you, got, you guys don't follow instructions very well. <laughs> But uh, this is a Sunday that I got assigned to preach, so ready or not, here we go. James chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verse 12 and reading through 18. Follow along in your Bible or uh, on the screen above. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be, kind, be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Jesus, I just thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I pray that you would speak through me and allow your spirit just to, to uh, speak to our hearts. And, and um, would you just have your way in this, this, this sermon and this service? And uh, would we just leave here encouraged and changed by your, your power? In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. There's an old saying that the only two things that are certain in life are death and taxes, right? Uh, but I would add that there are two more certainties in this life, 
and that's trials and temptations. And since there are certainties, we are going to face trials and we will have temptations. I think it's very important that we spend some time talking about them. Pastor Jeff a couple weeks ago preached a great message about trials and how it leads us into becoming a more mature, a more complete Christian. And, and when we go through these trials, oftentimes, you know, our prayers could kind of sound like, God, you see this circumstance, you see this trial, this is a really difficult thing that I'm going through, God. And so would you just change this circumstance? Remove this difficult thorn from my side. God, change it. But, but Pastor Jeff reminded us that God is more about developing people and, and so maybe a better prayer or approach to our prayer should be, God, you see everything that's going on in my life. You understand the pain and the trial that I'm going through. You see the temptations, God. So either change my circumstance or change me, God, and, and work through me and develop and grow me. Now, my preference would be that the circumstance would be changed every single time. But Josie, how are you doing? She's my friend from Omaha. She came to, that was a, uh, I'm sorry. It's so good to see you, Josie. We're college buddies. Hey, Josie. Okay. Um, sorry, that, wow, that was out of right field. Um, all right. Where was I? Changing circumstance. You know, that would be my preference. Um, that, that would be my preference, that God would change our um, uh, a circumstance, but, but God is more into changing and developing people. So as we look at the scripture today, I want to point out a few things about trials and temptations. And the first thing is this, trials often produce temptations. Trials will produce temptations. For instance, um, someone loses their job and is unemployed for a little while. Uh, it is tempting to become dishonest in the way you handle finances. Maybe you earn a little cash here and there, and, and then the temptation arises, well, I don't need to claim that on my taxes. Maybe it, it tempts you to steal. You know, and it's very easy to justify in this times uh, of this trial because God would understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. And, and we can begin to justify. Or maybe in your marriage, um, it, it's, it's a going through a tough time and the temptation arises to look outside of your marriage for pleasure. Or the temptation arises to bash your spouse or talk slanderous or in a hurtful manner behind his or her back. The temptation comes to withhold forgiveness. You know, may, maybe things get heated in your life and you, you come under some pressure and the temptation comes up where you need to, or you feel that you need to lie and say that you did something or you didn't do something, so you kind of worm yourself out and the pressure's not all on you. You know, I, I remember when I, I first went to college with Josie, um, you know, I, I was not overly excited because I had everything that I wanted or needed here. My friends, my family, uh, this church, I had my plan, I was gonna do DMAC because it's financially smart, and then I was gonna do Bible college. I, that was my, my plan, but God was like, you know what, you need to go to North Central. So I went there, I was upset, I was, I was just kind of throwing this temper tantrum, and, and this, uh, it, it was a really hard time. I, I, I remember calling my dad and just having a two hour conversation you know, with him multiple times where we didn't really say anything. It was just knowing that he was on the other line because uh, you know, I was just going through this, this tough time, and I remember crying myself to sleep, um, you know, that silent, real ugly cry, you know, trying not to let my, my roommate. It, it, was, it was definitely a trial that I was going through, and this temptation of disobedience came up in my life, you know. I, I was a, a Christian. I knew that I should read my Bible. I knew that I should pray. I knew that I should love others around me. I knew that I should worship God. Yet because I was in this difficult season, I completely shut down and I was disobeying God and, and I was really sinning against God because of that trial and that temptation I, I fell to. And eventually God slapped me and we got things worked out and, and I got my attitude turned around and, and I started um, you know, living for God, God again. But um, trials will lead to temptations. But the second thing that we can learn from this text is that trials and temptations are not caused by God. God's trying to get your attention or something. 
Trials and temptations are not caused by God. James tells us in verse 13 and 14 uh, that God is not a tempter. So let's, let's read that real quick. When tempted, in verse 13, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. You know, verse 17 says that every good and perfect gift is from above. So when things get tough in life, we really, really, really like to point blame. We like to point the finger. And it's very difficult to admit that we have any sort of fault in it. And and it becomes even more difficult when the person that you have conflict with or whatever it is, they're at 90% blame, but you're only at 10% blame. They started the fire, but you threw gas on the fire, you know? And it's very easy to, to, to point blame. When your marriage is failing, it's easier to see your spouse's shortcomings than your own. When you're in conflict with a friend, it's easy to point and blame and, and not take a look inside. And James is saying, no, 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 no. Don't, don't point blame. Stop pointing fingers. And especially, don't point blame at our perfect heavenly father. You know, uh, Verse 17 talks about every good gift comes from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change. God is a perfect God. You know, I, I uh, can't imagine a perfect father trying to tangle us. You know, I, I think of my dad. My dad would never set a booby trap and hope that I fall in it. You know, he would, he would never set a snare and hope that I run through it and that I would get entangled in this. So to say that God is causing you to be tempted is just so uh, anti of, of who he is. He loves you. He has your best interests in mind. He wants nothing more than for you to thrive and excel and push through and, and, and really have a life that is full of joy. And even if you don't have victory, God is there with you and encouraging you. You know, but, but just because um, God is perfect and he doesn't want those things for us, that doesn't mean that he won't allow certain things in your life to happen to you so that you can grow and develop. My dad warned me as a kid, Austin, put on a coat. Austin, put on a coat. It's cold outside. You'll get sick. You'll be cold. Austin, put on a coat. And guess what the 10 or 11-year-old Austin didn't want to do? Put on a coat. So what did my dad do? He let me go outside. And that didn't last long because I got cold and I came inside and he said, did you learn your lesson? I said, yes, sir. Did my dad ever stop loving me in that moment? No, but I had to run my course and allow this natural consequence of my decision so that I could grow and develop into the super mature, awesome person that I am now, okay? (laughs) Now, I'm not saying that uh, you just stop instructing your kids, you know, like uh, natural consequences, you know, like um, my dad also told me, don't play in the street, but that doesn't mean he ever stopped telling me to not play in the street because there's a difference between being cold and being smashed like a pancake. Um, There's a big difference in that. Um, But uh, God is perfect, uh, and, and he, because of his perfect nature, will never tempt you. And he doesn't want anything bad to happen to you. So if our, the scripture says to not blame God for our temptations, then who's to blame? And it answers right in our text. Oftentimes our trials and our temptations come from our own evil desires. Verse 14 says, each one is tempted by his own evil desire and he's dragged away and enticed. And whether we like to admit it or not, our temptations, and yes, sometimes our trials are caused because of our own actions and our own desires. Now, I don't like that because that puts responsibility on me, but anytime I'm going through a difficult time, I have to take a hard look in the mirror and say, Austin, did I do something that brought this on me? Austin, what is my responsibility in, in this? Why uh, in, in this moment, Um, of temptation, do I have, do I carry any sort of responsibility for that? Maybe you struggle with lust, but you find yourself spending an unnecessary amount of time on your computer purposely wandering Facebook or social media or whatever, and you have no real purpose of being on the internet. 
You know, you you see, sin equals opportunity plus desire. So you have to change your desire and eliminate the opportunity. So if you're thirsty for alcohol and you're spending time at the bar, that opportunity and that temptation is largely placed on your shoulders because you are the one who's wandering and and flirting with fire, right? I I tell um, my, my college students this all the time, and the common denominator in every conflict or every trial is you. That's hard pill to swallow. Maybe you're only a small fraction or a small part of that problem, but if you're on your fifth boyfriend or girlfriend and things aren't working out, guess what the constant variable is? Maybe God is allowing you to suffer to have these relationships, to have these conflicts because God is wanting you to work on you. He's not wanting you to be the fixer of someone else and fix all their problems. He's saying, hey, you know, I I need into your life. I I need to do some, some repair work. The other reason why we face trials and temptations is a result from other people's evils, actions, and desires. You know, there are times where where the trials we face are caused by other people. So please don't hear me this morning that if you're going through a trial, that it's your fault because there are times where it's just not your fault, okay? Don't carry that guilt. Um, I know that there are people that have have been divorced and it was clearly because of, of the other person and their actions. So if a drunk person crosses the line and kills your kid in a car accident, did you have anything to do with that? No, that's, that's someone else's action. If your employer has been dishonest and embezzling money without your knowledge, and all of a sudden you find yourself without a job, that obviously isn't your fault. It was caused by someone else's evil desire or action. And that's just the part of the fallen world that we live in. Jesus says, you will face troubles, but take hold, I have overcome the world. I have overcome Satan. You will face hard times, and whether you cause them or not, you will face temptations. So what does James say to do? In verse 12, he says to persevere, to press on, to keep on keeping on, to to not give up, to fight for it. Why do we persevere? Well, let's take a look in verse 12. It says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. You might be going through a really difficult time right now and it could be a number of things. You could have experienced a, a, a great loss in your life, but James says, blessed is the person who keeps on keeping on, who presses on, who doesn't give up. Nowhere in this scripture does it say that you have to receive the victory. It says that you keep on keeping on. Paul says that our temporary affliction is producing for us an eternal glory that far outweighs our troubles. I'll say that again because that's rich and that is just straight from scripture, that our temporary affliction is producing for us an eternal glory that far outweighs our troubles. Man, we may never see full victory here on earth, but our reward is a crown of life in heaven, and only those who persevere will receive it. You know, as I was studying this text, something really simple but kind of profound hit me, and maybe you've had this thought, maybe you haven't, but it's this, is that perseverance is the proof of our love. Persevering is a proof of love. Now, now that may seem super obvious to you, but this, was, this just hit me real. You know, I think in my marriage, I think in my friends, I think um, in, in the ministry, I, I think in my relationship with God, they all take work. And the minute that I stop persevering in those relationships is the minute that I stop loving that person. You know, perseverance in your marriage is proof that you still love your spouse. Perseverance in your friendship is proof that you still love that friend. If you're not persevering through your trials or you're no longer even fighting for that sin that has entangled you and you've just completely given up, you've thrown in the towel, then maybe your love for God is suspect. 
maybe the perseverance to say, well, I just, I can't do it. Let me tell you guys, as we just read, God is a perfect God. He will sustain you. He will hold you. He will give you victory. And we need to rid ourselves of ourselves and fill ourselves with Jesus Christ. And that starts in the morning. You'll wake up, say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Let me see and think the things that you see and think. God, let, let my, my actions and my words be pure. God, fill me. I need you. Give me victory in this, in that, God. I need by your power. God is a perfect father. And it doesn't matter how many times you've screwed up. Don't listen to the lies of Satan. You know, Satan, Satan is a, a complete liar and a deceptor. He, he's, he's the king of deception. And, and he's going to tell you things like, you screwed up too many times. You've gone too far one too many times. God will never do that. Yeah, Pastor Austin's talking about this, but you're different. God, God is the same. And he's going to extend that mercy and that grace and that strength to all of you. And I'm going to give you guys the opportunity at the end of the service to respond and come forward for prayer and find victory through Christ. So, we, so far we know that our, our trials produce temptations, that God doesn't tempt us, that either ourselves or other people cause trials and temptations. We know that God is a, a perfect father and he has our best interests in mind. And we know that we're supposed to persevere through difficult times. So let's take a look at how to biblically and effectively persevere. And I think the first step is to ask the right questions. It's, it's simply asking the right questions. So often we have this circumstance, this trial, this this event that happens to us, and, and it's horrible, and, and it happens, and we look back and we say, why, God? Why did this happen? Why me? Why now? And, and you see, that's a very backwards-looking question. And even if I received the answer to why that happened, that wouldn't get me to where I need to be. So a forward-looking question is, what's next? How am I going to overcome this? What do I do now? And the answer to all of those forward-looking questions is Jesus Christ. How am I going to get through this? By the strength that Jesus provides me. What am I going to do now? I'm going to keep on keeping on because God is my fuel. And he provides my energy and my fight and my strength. You know, um, God um, is empowering you by his spirit to do what you can't do in your flesh. You say you're tired, God says I'll give you rest. You say you're weak, God says I'll give you strength. You say you're scared, God says I'll give you peace. You say I don't know what's next, God says trust me, I've got this. God will give you joy, a patience, an endurance, a perseverance, and we must keep on being filled with the power and the presence of the great I am. God is our sustaining strength. He's the one who fills us. Take another look at 17. It says that God does not change. And, and we have confidence because God has a perfect track record. You can go back through the history of the Bible in your own life and say, hey, God, have you ever let me down? Has he ever let anybody down? No, his character is faithful. He is true. He, is, he has always been there. He always will be there. And because of that, I can have confidence today that because of what he did yesterday and the years before, that he's going to do that for me today, tomorrow, and the rest of my life. God will do that. You know, just, just because your, your prayers aren't being answered quite the way that you envision them being answered, it doesn't mean that God is not answering your prayers. You know, I, I may not know the why to your problem, but I know the person that will carry you through them. And his name is Jesus Christ. God's our strength. He's a perfect father, and he will make sure that you make it through the trial. You will overcome. I read a story about Andrew Jackson. How many know who Andrew Jackson is? Are the people with their hands down? You guys need to go back to eighth grade history class. He was a U.S. president, okay? I didn't mean that to be insulting, but kind of. <laughs> so, some of his boyhood friends 
uh, just couldn't understand of how Andrew had, had become this famous general and then president of the United States. And they knew of other men who had greater talent but who had never succeeded. One of Jackson's friends said, why Jim Brown, who lived right down the pike from Jackson, was not only smarter, but he could throw Andy three out of four times in a wrestling match. But look where Andy is now. Another friend responded, how did there happen to be a fourth time? Didn't they usually say three times and out? Sure, they were supposed to, but not Andy. He would never admit he was beat. He would never stay throwed. Jim Brown would get tired, and on the fourth try, Andrew Jackson would throw him and be the winner. Andrew Jackson would not accept defeat. And the thing that counts in life is not how many times you're throwed. and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in just a moment, It's a very biblical thing. It says, uh, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Every time we do something physical, like moving out of our seats, it's like this outward expression of what's happening on the inside. And, and sometimes it just takes, uh, like, the boldness, the courage, the faith. And just allow God's Spirit to speak to you this morning. Maybe you're here and you're just going through a trial. Whether you cause it or not, there is just something that is difficult in your life. Perseverance. I am just in this horrible season. I am going through this trial right now, and I need God to come and give me strength because I can no longer fight on my own. If that's you on my right, your left, would you just raise your hand? Actually, just all across the room. Yeah. And you're, you've been throwed so many times, you just feel like, like Satan's got you in the corner of the ring and you're just losing air and, and he's just getting his shots in and, and you just can't overcome this and, and you're just here and you're just saying, God, I, I need you to help me overcome. I need your mind to replace my mind for your thoughts are higher, your ways are higher, God. I need to run from certain things. I need to disconnect from certain things. I need to connect into the source and the power of who you are, God. And I'm, I'm done fighting with this temptation, with this struggle, and I'm wanting and declaring freedom in Jesus' name. If that's you and you'd say, man, I'm just struggling with something, and I have been, and I need the power of God, would you just raise your hand this morning so that I can pray? Yes, yes. How many others? And lastly, I want to give the opportunity for those who have not yet asked Jesus into your heart. You've, you've never experienced the perfect, unfailing, unwavering love of, of Jesus Christ in your life. 
and you're saying this morning for the first time, I'm asking God to come into my life. I'm asking him to, to, to cleanse me of my sins. I'm sorry for what I've done. I, I no longer want to live for myself, for the things. I'm sick of feeling empty, God. I need the hope and, and, and the promise of Jesus Christ. And you say, Austin, I'm, I'm repenting of my sin and I'm, I'm turning from, from my ways and I'm asking Jesus into my heart for the first time. On my right, your left, is there anyone here that would say, Austin, I want Jesus to come in, forgive my heart, forgive me of what I've done. Yes. Yes, I see you, young girl. Now my left, your right. Yes, I see you in the back. God, I thank you for every hand this morning. First, God, for those that are just saying, I'm, I need you. I pray that you would forgive their sins, that you would remove the stain of guilt and shame, God, that they would experience your mercy and a grace in a powerful way, God. It would motivate them and change them, God, and that they would realize that they don't have to go through life without you. And I just pray that this morning they would experience so much of your Holy Spirit, God, that, that they would experience and, and know that no matter how far they've maybe gone or, or how much wrong they've done, God, that there is grace and there is mercy that flows freely from you, Jesus. And I pray that you'd give them the power to turn from those sins and to just every day spend time in prayer. I pray for those that are going through trials, God. They're just feeling defeated. They're feeling broken. They don't know how much more that they can take, God. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would pour out on this congregation, minister to marriages, God, to finances, God, to, to uh, work problems, to friend problems, to family relations, God. I just pray that you would just be uh, King and Lord over these, these trials, God, and, and those struggling with temptations, Jesus. I just pray that in the name of Jesus, chains would be broken, that addictions would be broken, God, that they would stop fighting on their own and they would be filled every morning with the power of, of your Holy Spirit in their life, God, and you would enable them to be victors and receive that crown of life, God. I pray that none of us would grow weary, but we would learn to rest and wait for you, God, and call on your name and run to your name, God, as it's a strong tower, God. How we love you and we praise you and you are perfect in every way that you are, Jesus. So reveal yourself, God, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen.